Okay. So this is our I'll try of this of our our discussions and activities today, and then they will start to first about the introduction, and I will go to the author's background, and then, then Hector will have the uh, uh, will link the historical background of our this book, and then we will like each group members will have an overview and major issues. After that, we have a, a break. Uh, we will take break. After that, we will have some activities and uh, discussions, and then we will have some reflections of our of our today's class. So, uh, Lee will start the uh, introduction of our book first. So, go ahead, Lee. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay, great. Um, I'm coming in from Chicago today. I'm on um, spring break for my work, so this happens to fall really nicely in the year. Um, we are responsible for quite a book called Modernity at Large, Cultural Dimensions of Globalization. And I think in order to even begin to wrap your head around this book, we need to even unpack the title. So modernity we can interpret in many ways, but um, taking from the author, Arjun Apadurai, he's an Indian anthropologist and constructed this book at the um, the heyday of Indian um, India's economy in the 1990s and published it in 1996 um, and so at that time what he understood to be modernity involved a few things and I think they're worthy to note here the first one is technology followed by modern science mass participation in politics Massive investments in higher education, which we've been discussing throughout the year with Baker's book, and immense propaganda for new ideas about citizenship. So that's his understanding of modernity, and we can perhaps discuss that and what that will entail with this book as we go along. Um, also, globalization. So he takes on this cultural aspect. He's an anthropologist, and so his interest is the study of people. And it's almost as though, you know how a photographer has a lens and they can zoom in really closely and everything will focus, and then they'll zoom out and everything will focus? This author is able to do that looking at the level of neighborhoods, at the national level of India, and also looking transnationally and globally, which is really <laughs> quite a feat. Um, but going back to culture, for him, he understands this as a consciousness. Culture is a consciousness of attributes, which include um, material things, language, and territory. And he proposes, as we can see, I believe, in the next Slide. I'm not sure who is responsible over there for... Okay. Great. Yeah, Culturalism. Mm -hmm. So this is a word that he conjures up, and it involves this conscious effort at creating identity. So culturalism, again, creating identity and being aware of that process. I think throughout this course we've been talking about whether globalization is a conscious act or whether it's simply happening to us but he takes the point of view that it actually is a to some degree a decision of some kind. This transitions into another theme of this book called scapes. And I think when we all see scapes we think of landscapes and we'll go into this in depth of the different kinds of scapes that Apadurai imagines but he looks at this from not just territory, but politics and ideology and so forth. The third point here, lasting effects of decolonization. This is um, the, the heart of the book, at the center of the book, and actually talks about the sport of cricket and how cricket um, shows what has happened in India once they've gotten their independence, and um, that'll be an interesting talk later on. Enumeration of groups. This is looking at the way that we classify people and how that has changed over time, and particularly in the Indian context. And finally, this idea of tribes, 
and neighborhoods. And this book does a really nice job of actually diving into contextualization. Um, the reading that we posted on the discussion board is specifically looking at what a Paterai's idea of contextualization is, but essentially context, he took it from linguistics as you have a text, and within that text you have to understand what is surrounding, what are the different components that come before and come after. Um, could you please go to the next slide? Yeah. Okay. And also, when we're talking about globalization, I like this quote that he pulled from James Rosano from 1990, and the image that he had, and that's why I've chosen this image, is, a, is of cascades. So rather than envisioning our past and the world that we live in, just the sequence of isolated events that happen, um, one thing here, one thing in the Middle East, one thing in Europe, that these ebb and flow in an interesting way. So this quote talks about um, a multi-centric world, which again goes back to the idea of scapes in which um, ideas and movements gather momentum, stall, reverse course, and resume anew. So much like a waterfall in which tri water trickles and gathers in different ways and comes back again, we can begin to understand from this author's view what globalization could mean in our world today. So that is my introduction for you. Okay, so I'll have a brief introduction about the author's background. And first, uh, the author was born in 1949. Um, his name is Arjun and he's an Indian. And now he's a social cultural anthropologist. So uh, uh, the author was born in Mumbai, and now it changes name. I don't know which one's name. And yeah. Bombay, Bombay. It was Bombay. Yeah. yeah. And uh, actually, he he has uh, he finished his uh, education in like high school, and uh, also he got a degree in in India. And that's why he has very strong like relationship with India, and all his books, his examples, and his uh, uh, later uh, concepts or the the cultural concepts or globalization concepts is, uh, was uh, closely related to his early lives. And then after that, he thought that uh, he has, uh, in, actually in this book, Modernity Lodge, he mentions that uh, uh, even though he got uh, he had an education in India and had, he had uh, a, a like, um, British background or knowledge about that, that he was uh, attracted about uh, the Americans' uh, culture and the modernities. That's why uh, this kind of attraction that uh, leads him to America to pursue his actual as a great degree, and then after that, um, his um, master's degree, and then he finished his PhD from the University of Chicago, and uh, and and he studied the historical history and also on also social thought. And uh, at first, uh, actually, at first he worked uh, at the university before. Uh, at first, he worked at the University of Chicago, and after that, actually, he worked, also worked at the University of Pennsylvania, and then Yale, and, uh, and uh, right now, he worked at the New School University. And all his work are related to cultural and uh, globalizations. And, and uh, during this time, so he also did a lot of uh, field work in India, research field work. And then his uh, research interests are these things like historical anthropology and anthropology of globalization. And he mainly focused on ethnic violence, consumption space, housing, and the public culture and international civil society or urban South Asia. And uh, he, he is also an expert of the mass media and histo historical study of the states of policies. And uh, 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 I just uh, li list uh, three of his books here. And because I think that this uh, these books are like very important for and or similar has similar topics or themes related to modernity at large. And the nearest book is uh, was published in 2013. Actually, it's the last year. It's called the future as 
cultural facts, essays on the global, global condition. Actually, this, uh, uh, this book is a, a collection of the essays, and it is, a, a, it is a, a product of the 10 years research and writing constituting an important contribution of uh, globalization studies. And, uh, um, and in his book, in this book, uh, essays are focused on violence, commodi commodification, nationalism, terror, and, um, and uh, materiality. And uh, also in this book, he's uh, focused on the, on his research will focus on um, India. And in the second book, it's called The Fear of Small Numbers. And this is, uh, on, in this book, he answers the question that, uh, why the globalization has been prolifer uh, proliferation of a violence of ethnic cleaning on, on the one hand and extreme and extreme forms of, of uh, political violence against the civil civilian populations on the other hand. And also in, in the second book in 2006, and, and he mentions uh, something about the dark side of the globalization, such as uh, suicide means anti-Americanism, Something like that, and uh, I think this book is a thoughtful invitation to rethink what violence is in an age of globalization. In the last book, it was published in a very early age, uh, and and uh, this book is uh, talks about uh, like um, it talks about uh, the author. Uh, yeah, it talks about the methods and concept concepts of both cultural anthropology and the social history history of a construct of a model of institutional change in South Asia under colonial rule. So, so all his books are actually uh, talk about the cultural globalization and, uh, and the violence, yeah, similar, uh, or colonialism, similar topics. And then these are the, uh, also his books, but he, but it's, uh, he was uh, the editor of these books. If you're interested, you can, you can read these books after. Discuss. So Hector will connect some historical background with this book. Hector, are you there? I'm going to tell you all about it. Yeah, I'm waiting for you to present. <laughs> Yikes. 
what's yeah. going on right now. I'm confused. For a while there, it sounded like somebody was on the moon. <laughs> yeah, it, it does that sometimes, I think. So, can we go up on the next floor and then later after I have to All right, I'm just going to send him a quick email okay. letting him know we're going to move on. So, after I have to start about historical background, so we will have an overview of this book first. Hi, Charlie. Okay, it's for, for, for one person. So, just, so. Okay. So I'm going to begin our um, very brief summary, basically, of, here, of modernity at large. Uh, I found this book really interesting, but his um, his theories and his ideas are very abstract, and his writing style is. It's almost artistic, the way he uses phrases and words and kind of weaves around concepts and ideas. So in order to, to make it um, a presentation that you guys could still understand and enjoy without having read the book, or read the whole book, I'm sure you were able to read the excerpt, um, we're going to kind of break it down into the main, uh, there's three parts of the book, um, and then kind of the highlight ideas of, of each of the parts. So right in the beginning, um, and as Leah has mentioned before, um, Apadurai is um, really influenced by, um, you know, India coming, kind of coming of age in the 90s, and what he saw was happening there in India. And I think it's really obvious knowing that now when you, um, when you learn about the escapes and how he kind of thinks about globalization and the, you know, the flow of culture in globalization. Um, I can't see my notes on that one, so I'm going to come over here. So he's designed these uh, five scapes that kind of depict the global cultural flows, and I'm just going to bring up my quick notes here. And we ha I wrote them over here so that once I advance the slide, that the, the idea of the scapes don't need you, so that they stick with us throughout the whole presentation. Because I think he really does build his whole argument and his whole um, you know, points of the book behind me. So the five scapes are ethnoscape, technoscape, finance scape, and idea scape. Um, and Leah again did mention those. So with an ethnoscape, this is more the idea of the movement of people. And I kind of think of the scape as almost like a moving wheel or a spinning circle or something. So this is the, as I bring in here, the landscape of people who make up the shifting world. Um, so this is just the movement of people going around the world. And this also, um, I, you know, it, it is a movement of people, so you are seeing in the book a lot of communities moving, people moving, and it affects the stability of people. And you're not sure if it's really a good thing or a bad thing. He um, comes out as being a little apathetic, um, as he says in his book. So it's just there. The communities are moving. They're not as stable as they used to be. Um, and then he goes into the techno space. So this is the 90s. Where you know we're getting into um, the age of computers and the internet, um, and this is the, glo the global configuration of technology. Um, this is the high-speed network that um, allows us to communicate and is almost allowing um, all of these other things, all the other states to happen. So also in the technoscape, um, as I said, it's global configuration of um, things moving. But, oops, sorry, things moving very quickly at a high speed. Um, and this is also what is allowing now for these multinational um, corporations and enterprises to get going. Um, next, we have the finance scape. So, of course, this is money, global capital, um, global capital networks, the movement of money around. And I thought it was really interesting. One of the points he brought up was, you know, millions and billions are moving throughout these um, throughout the finance scape. And of course, that affects nations. It affects the big corporations. It affects the very wealthy. But those movements of money and capital also might affect the cost of something by one cent, which can have a huge effect on local people, local people, local people. Um, then we have media scapes and idea scapes, which are um, similar ideas. Media scape, sorry. So the media scape is now the electronic capability to quickly distribute information. This is image, an image centered narrative um, and an image centered. An image-centered account of reality allows for quick distribution of information throughout the throughout the world. Um, and this scape is, along with the idea scape, is dominated by media and dominated by marketing and advertising, which isn't just happening 
from corporations. It's also linking states um, and communities who are affecting that. Um, and then I do think is uh, he says it's primarily the political kind of I see this as the political side of media states. So it's the primarily political ideologies ideology of states. Um, and in this state, the images here are composed of enlightenment worldview. Okay, enlightenment world of the enlightenment worldview. So words like um, welfare, democracy, ideas like that dominate this state. And these states are kind of moving and turning people. People are moving. Technology is allowing communication. Is allowing tech, is allowing people to move. Um, it's allowing money to move around. We're having ideas that are moving around. And I just kind of see um, the, as these states are turning around. This is what is driving this global cultural flow in his modern world. If all these things are moving around. All these things are sort of flowing together. Um, this is what's driving the cultural flow that he's talking about. Okay. Let me just make sure I covered everything here. Yes, okay. All right. And now we have um, one of the next major ideas that he brings up, which is this lovely word, deep territorialization. Um, and he says this is a movement that brings laboring population um, uh, of the world into the lower class sectors and spaces of more wealthy, of the wealthier societies. Um, it creates exaggerated and intensified sense of criticism um, and attaches kind of this criticism back to the home state. So these populations, because of the states, because of the, the modern cultural flows that are happening, people instead of thinking, all right, I'm going to move from town A to town B, which is five miles away, I'm now able to move from country A to country B or across the world. These populations move together because it's an ethnoscape, so people are moving, um, communities are moving as, as one community together. Um, but they still retain this connection to the homeland. Um, and like anything that you sort of leave behind, there's a rosy tint to it almost. So um, the, the populations that are moving away, the populations that have become deterritorialized, kind of take on this fantasy view of what they left behind, where everything was great, everything was wonderful, um, everything good in retrospect. Um, and that these um, deterritorialized people, um, there's more than one group of them. So people are constantly moving around. There's constantly these fantastical visions of the homeland, which are um, butting up against, butting up against one another. Um, and also, the states do keep um, interfering with this and do keep pushing these people to move around. Um, and then he starts to talk about mass media and how marketing and um, the images that are in these states also do affect these. All right. And also part of this is imagination, which drives consumerism and consumption. And this is, for me, where it's, um, the theories kind of became fantastical as he talks about, you know, people talking about the, um, you know, the, the homeland. So, excuse me, my notes are okay. So imagination and consumerism are also a very large part of the global flow. Um, imagination is also driving the scapes, the ethnoscape, the finance scapes, especially the media and the idea scapes. Um, but most of all, the ethnoscapes, because it's the people that are moving all the other networks, all the other scapes. Um, and as we said, as people are bumping into one another, they're influenced by each other's media scapes and idea scapes. Um, and there can be a difference or an escalation in consumerism. So essentially, um, people are moving around. They're dreaming of, of a life outside of, of their traditional homeland, their traditional culture. And they're, um, they're also being driven by consumerism. So as people are going through, they're consuming products. They're becoming affected by the different ethnoscapes and the different, um, sorry, not the different ethnoscapes, the different mediascapes and ideascapes. Um, they start to imitate one another. So the, the deterritorialized de people start to act and look a little bit different than they did when they were in their, you know, the, the homeland because of the interactions of the different, um, the different ideas that are that are there in the state. Um, and then this is just a cycle. The way I understand it, this is just a cycle that just keeps happening. As more people are moving around, as there's more of this deterritorialization, 
um, people are consuming more of these products and their ideas are just constantly shifting and changing, which constantly feeds the demand as more products become available and especially ideas as well. Okay, First, part two. Is it possible to try to invite Hector again? He's saying that he can't get into this conversation. Yeah, sure, we're going to do that. And I don't think I have the power as a viewer and participant to do that right now. I think, too, he has, like, two accounts. I'm not sure why, but he pops up. There he is, maybe. Okay, right. Yeah, please, please. Should we do all the calls and then go back to his? Yeah. Okay. Hector, are you there? Okay, I'll send him a quick email letting him know that. Hector, we see you. I'm not sure if we can hear you. Can you hear us? Hello. Hi. So while they're uh, working on connecting with Hector, I just wanted to remind you that one of the reasons why uh, this book and this idea of these states are important for us is because in comparative education, there is often talk about policy states. And policy states was, uh, was an idea that was uh, created based off of uh, a categorized idea of these different states. And it, it, it really uses his rationale and his idea about how they move and change to describe how education policy also has this sort of space that it lives in that, that, that creates its own oh, state. Yeah. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a more critical view of how that operates, but it's an important one. And uh, you'll, um, we're not reading uh, any of that specific work in this class, but you are, I'm sure, will encounter it in other classes if you haven't already. Stephen Carney is uh, uh, Australian, but he's at the University of Washington, and Denmark. And uh, he, he has an article in particular, I, I can't, I'm blanking on uh, which journal it's in, that talks about a uh, policy state and he looks at Nepal in particular and how uh, education policy would have been affected in Nepal as part of this policy state. Uh, okay, are we back? Yeah, you're back. All right, so part two is called post-national locations, and in this part there are there's this focus on cricket, which Hector is going to come back to in a little bit. Um, but for the time being, I'd like to touch on what Apaterai um, discusses regarding numbers. If you could go to the next slide, please. Yep. And it's called Number in the Colonial Imagination. So he looks at number through, again, this Indian mindset. And <clears throat> again, considering it's the 1990s, there were two um, major things happening at this time aside from the economy. So you had different castes against one another, and you also had this religious component. And I mean, this continues in the world today, but Hindus and Muslims against one another. Um, he talks about how Orientalism, which isn't part of our lingo today, really, um, was associated with exoticism, strangeness, and difference. So there's really this sense, like um, Gail talked about in her post on the discussion board, was this idea of we and you, that there's very much a dichotomy between um, us and the other. And it's interesting to see this book written from what often is considered the other, the other becomes us. And so when the, when the British came in and they're trying to do um, census data, this was a completely new idea in India and really the way in which the British were doing it was bizarre because it was classifying people only by 
their territory and only by their occupation, whereas India had viewed itself as this diversity of castes and religions and the census data really flipped everything on its head. And um, if you go to the next slide, this transformed the, their identity and how they viewed themselves. So the British were very specific about numbers and this had never been that important in Indian culture, but actually using this data in a meaningful way. So the British had this idea of um, initially having records, which I imagine to be all of those medical files and stacks and bookcases of all of this paper that you never want to dig through. It's like a nightmare. And transitioning into reports, so taking the data and making something meaningful out of it. And so numbers became this language in which different cultures could interact with each other and understand um, the diversity within and try to explain different things. So this was a, a major shift that Apatari, um discussed. And we'll look at how the game of cricket ties into these numbers in a bit, which is really interesting. But I'll save that for Hector in a little while. Uh, hello everyone, uh, I'm glad to uh, present uh, my understanding of the book, especially uh, uh, concerning the third, uh, third part. Uh, I think the whole book, the first part is uh, concerning the globalization, uh, the general description. And uh, the second part is about the, the, the contextualization, is the, the mechanism of the globalization. Uh, of the, uh, the, uh, the dialect or interrupt, uh, interactions of uh, between the globalization and the lo location. And now uh, I think the third part is his, uh, uh, is his conclusion, uh, his tentative uh, conclusion, as, as we know, yeah. uh, uh, Abdure is uh, an, an, an a dialectic thinker. Uh, yeah. so, so this conclusion uh, is, uh, I think, conclusion is tentative and uh, not so certain. But uh, yeah, I think the third part is about the consequence of the globalization and the conceptualization. The third part is about so yeah, it's, uh, and the third part is, I think, it is divided into three sub uh, sub parts. So first, they uh, face about uh, the pre, uh, pre, uh, pre primordialism, uh, primordialism. The third, uh, uh, the, the, the sixth is about uh, uh, the uh, about the, 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 uh, the patriarchism, and third is about, about the location. And we see the, uh, the the subtitles of the third part. Uh, that is post-national location. That means, yeah. Uh, yeah during his uh, studies, and now come, uh, come to the conclusion. That means he uh, laid more stress on the third part and uh, uh, yeah, try to, uh, yeah, yeah, to put it simply that he put uh, much uh, uh, more on the locations. I think he, he re regarded the location or the locality as something of the salvation, I, I, I think. So <clears throat> now we, uh, we, we, we look at the three subtitles. The first thing about about the primordialism. Uh, primordialism, I think it is uh, a a primitive and a relatively, relatively popular or prevailing in today's world. But uh, uh, yeah, it is uh, uh, it is that uh, it is uh, uh, it is uh, a sentiment, a sentiment about yeah, yeah, about a strong sense of a group identity, yeah, a weakness. And it's usually connected with the uh, with the ethnic uh, ethnicity group. group. Yeah, that means uh, we, we, we can see from the, the Ukraine crisis, we, we can see that uh, some people have this emotions and sentiments. Yeah. Some people have the uh, Ukraine have have the 
true Western sentiment. And some people have, have, have uh, uh, the hostility to the Moscow style. This is something like uh, 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 connected with uh, pro modernism. And, uh, uh, but uh, uh, according to Abdul Reis' study, he thinks that pre modernism uh, has no uh, uh, explanatory, uh, explanatory power for today's world, uh, world order. Uh, especially for the for the nation state, uh, nation state. So <clears throat> we think uh, the primordialism is not born, uh, but created by the nation state, not so originated and uh, born, the uh, inborn sentiment, not not so. Uh, and, uh, yeah, from the first part we can, uh, we we think uh, 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 we. Uh, we know that Abdul Ray is uh, a uh, culturalistic uh, thinker. Uh, he think so. Primordialism, he think, uh, yeah, th is created by the nation state and uh, mainly deeply influenced by the cultural and the social uh, and the social uh, social factor. We, as an educator, we can understand that this, uh, this conclusion very well. The, 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 the emotion not uh, not uh, inborn, but uh, made by the uh, by the culture and the society. <coughs> And uh, the natural state want to promote uh, yeah, this primordialism through the cultural, uh, the cultural events. But uh, yeah, yeah, uh, from this uh, study, we can uh, have, to have the similar, uh, similar ideas, uh, uh, similar ideas of, uh, of Frankfurt, uh, Frankfurt uh, School, and uh, for example, Theodor Adorno, uh, he, he thinks the cultural is the most important thing. Yeah. But uh, uh, different from uh, Adorno, uh, he thinks that the people have uh, have the ability to think, reflect it, or critically about the, the cultural and the social influence. Uh, and this gives the space for the, uh, for the uh, 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 dialectic and the interaction between the globalization and the lo locality. Otherwise, uh, yeah, it is so uh, uh, permissive. Yeah. <coughs> and uh, and who, uh, he thinks that the, the primordialism uh, is, uh, yeah, is has no uh, is no use in uh, uh, in accounting uh, accounting the ethnicity of the 20th century. So, uh, and uh, he thinks uh, the patriotism is also. So uh, yeah, uh, also uh, not so uh, explanatory power uh, for the uh, for the for today's world order. Uh, I think uh, the patriotism is in crisis in today's world in today's globalization era, uh, globalizing era, and uh, uh, because he thinks nation state is in crisis. From the first two parts, we have uh, vividly experienced uh, uh, appearance, uh, and he, he thinks so because of two uh, two major factors. One is the Maya, uh, the larger scale uh, migration between the national uh, between the nations. The second is is uh, is the, uh, is the, 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 uh, the electronic uh, electronic the media uh, media. So. So he think uh, patriotism now is transnational, not national, not national. He think American is a good example for this new uh, patriotism. He think America, uh, uh, United States is a state, a hyphen, a hyphen state. Yeah. Uh, America is uh, uh, culturally diverse, but economic, economically very powerful and uh, successful. Successful experiment for the new uh, trans, uh, transnational patriotism. Yeah. He himself, he he has uh, 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 he, he has uh, the India passport, but they live in uh, live in the uh, United States for more than yeah, so, so, uh, thirty years. Uh, he married a uh, 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 little proud. Uh, 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 he married an uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, 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 woman, and here we are. And have a sign of uh, of much culture. So, so he think uh, 
uh, in America is not uh, not not the uh, not like the traditional state. Uh, traditional state has a uh, uh, street a uh, solid uh, bond and uh, uh, and uh, have little room for the uh, for the uh, diverse uh, diversification uh, diverse. Yeah, and now yeah, because the patriotism is transnational. Translational means uh, in in, in race study means locality. Means locality. So that means the patriotism now is shifted to the locality. Uh, the, the shift in the locality. Locality is not a space. Uh, not space. It's a it, it is a, a, a structure of feeling. We can see the locality, primordialism, and the patriotism. These three thing, uh, three categories is connected with uh, emotions. Uh, it's emotions that uh, means the the people's loyalty uh, and emotions are now uh, not uh, not pointed to the nation state, till to a transnational locality, uh, transnational locality. So uh, this uh, yeah uh, 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 this is the his uh, this is uh, these are his uh, his tentative. Uh, uh, conclusion about uh, the, the, the but uh, at the same time he pointed out uh, the locality is uh, now in today's uh, world is weak and vulnerable not so strong but it is uh, uh, it's on, it's on the rise but not so, so strong uh, it is uh, uh, negatively or the weakened by the national states uh, by political flows and the electronic and the virtual Community, these three main factors he has uh, listed in this book. Um, now, uh, look at the. Uh, now, let us look at the three tentative conclusions. I don't know. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I have a, I have a deep uh, empathy for his studies. Uh, he has uh, made a lot of findings we have not uh, noticed. We, to which we had not uh, paid, paid so much attention, or we find some things we had uh, we uh, we take for granted, because he uh, and the, the 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 most important uh, finding is that he find uh, uh, something I call the third space that is the diasporic space. He lived in this space, and he uh, we are first uh, yeah uh, I'll say the first. Yeah, someone lived in the first uh, space. Someone lived in the uh, uh, in the uh, second place, but he lived in the third place. This third place is not the dominant uh, space. Is not the stranger uh, space, but between the uh, dominant and the uh, stranger uh, space, uh, it's a between world, like between world. So I, I think uh, yeah, uh, just around the corner, uh, this this uh, also. Uh, uh, there is also a, a diasporic space that is, I, I live there. <laughs> it's a, a, a part uh, it's a, just uh, very close to here. <clears throat> so, so I think uh, yeah, I, I admire his uh, his work. But uh, I, I think his yeah, I, I have uh, I, I have a, 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 a that to, uh, yeah, the three tentative conclusion about the imagination. About the feelings, but when the feelings come together or they come to or run, run, run to the realities of the money power, so that I, I think his theory has also uh, yeah, yeah, very limited in, in planning the today's world. For example, the primordialism, he think primordialism no, no. is large. But uh, I, I think, hello, uh, hello? yeah, Mr. Putin, oh, uh, uh, President Putin, we are not, uh, uh, yeah, make this conclusion. Do not get some of this dead, this bygone. President Putin don't like it, uh, do not think so. Yeah, not think. And he, he thinks that patriotism uh, is uh, at large. I think, uh, think uh, uh, President George uh, uh, W. Bush and uh, Obama, uh, we are not uh, agreed with him. Yeah. Because, uh, 
uh, from Obama and uh, in Bush uh, as uh, administration, yeah, uh, it, 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 it was uh, it was uh, pretty much engaged uh, a, a law about uh, it is the Patriot Act, the Patriot Act, and uh, Obama's uh, uh, strategic uh, policy is to uh, contain China. Uh, contain China. That is uh, 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 yeah, the reflection of the patriotism. Uh, patriotism. And the location, uh, locality is at uh, large. I think the Chinese people they are, uh, they are not uh, agree with him. But uh, China is uh, the biggest defense of the national sovereignty. So uh, location, locality. We we are very cautious and alert about uh, the locality. Uh, locality. So, uh, uh, of course, he. Yeah, in his books, yeah, this conclusion uh, is not so clear. Uh, I must say, this is uh, he's a, a dialectic thinker, uh, not so, 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 yeah, something like uh, uh, Karl Marx. Uh, Karl Marx, and uh, he focuses his attention on the uh, diasporic space. That means this is not the dominant space. Yeah. That means he appropriates uh, globalization from below. From the not from the above, so he have the uh, deep uh, uh, understanding of the empathy, uh, empathy or sympathy for the for the people living in the uh, politics of this. So, so, so we yeah yeah yeah. Uh, his uh, I think his work is uh, very important. important. So, but I think. Uh, yeah, uh, he, he yeah this con con consider this conclusion. I think uh, yeah, Mister Abdul Ray is at large and uh, at large. Thank you for your attention. So we will go back to Hector to explain the historical background first, and then we'll go back to the major issues. So Hector, are you ready? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Sure, I go back. Yeah. To the sound is great now. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, well, sorry for the for the technological difficulties. You know, it's part of the globalization issues. You know, nowadays, but. Uh, Okay, fortunately we're back. Uh, yeah, regarding the background, uh, basically uh, we can see that uh, during those days before uh, uh, Pandurai wa was born, uh, what was going around the world uh, in in his in his country, home country, India, we uh, Mahatma Gandhi was uh, basically on the final road for the independence. So uh, 1948, which was uh, the, the real date of the independence of India basically started a new time, yeah, uh, a new era for India. So uh, at this point, I mean, he wasn't born, but he was born one year afterwards. But this is like okay, a, a new, a new vision for India was 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 beginning. So it's one of the big issues going around the world. And then uh, following, please, the exactly on the other side, I mean. Like eastern part from India, there's a big, big issue going in in China. Uh, Mao Zedong was basically confirming the the communist uh, People's Republic of China, China, as as a new country. So we can say that communism started to 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 develop in those years. And I mean, obviously, it took many years to develop, but it was the beginning of a new era in China. And if we move a little bit to another part of the world, in the next slide, we can see that uh, down in South Africa, there were basically uh, institutionalizing the, the apartheid. So another big event, I mean, uh, trying to divide people because of uh, the color of the skin and all these issues, and it was a big thing in, in, in South Africa. And uh, that was, I mean, if we go around the world, there were many, many huge events going on, and this was also a, a, a big issue that will uh, mark a little bit uh, 
uh, powderized uh, point of view afterwards. And if we move then to the other part of the world, like uh, almost uh, 360, we can find uh, this is, uh, there's a previous one, I think, so sorry, a previous slide. Uh, oh, let me see, yeah, uh, that one basically in, in the western part of the United States of America, we had, I mean, basically World War II ended uh, a few years before, and the new, also a new era, a new window was opening for, for that part of the world, the western part, especially the United States, new events going on. So all of this took a few years to develop, all these big issues. And uh, our uh, author, uh, Mr. Apadurai, basically uh, he, he started to, to see all these developments when he was a teenager, even in, in, in Mumbai. And I suppose he, he started to imagine all these things and what was, there, what was happening around the world. He went to the, uh, he used to go to the movies and in, in, in a theater next to his place, and he saw these uh, movies from from uh, United States of America, basically that, that brought in. And he was like interested. In what's going on in the other part of the world? Why all of these new things? That uh, I would like to 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 go to this place. That was his 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 idea. And and on the other side, he was reading uh, stories about North America. Uh, uh, by the through the magazine Life, so he was gathering all these ideas, started to gather all these ideas, and and building up all this new new uh, um, like a scenario regarding all the different things, so the different big events going around the world. But on the other side, he was in a in a country which which I mean, he, he I mean he loves India, he's from there, but he wanted to discover what what's going on, what's what's all those connections, all those links. We saw these events, and we see him when he uh, went to the United States to study for his uh, master's degree and, and uh, doctorate. I, he started to gather all this information. I mean, was after 20 something years. So, all these events in China and South Africa and US, uh, and they were already, I mean, developing. So, all that information that he had in his mind. He, he had to put it in the, some way and, and think about new developments uh, from the anthropological point of view and sociological point of view. And that's why he came up with all these different books, including the, our uh, book today, uh, Modernity at Large. So I think he, he has been uh, recollecting all this data, I mean, from his, his own experience and what's going on around the world and try to frame it from, from a different point of view. That's, that's more or less the historical background that I wanted to share with you guys. Any questions? I think we're going to move to major issues. Okay, great. So this part, um, we will extract the main ideas from the three sections of the book, and um, I will go. I'm going to talk about the scapes because um, these the scapes are, are mostly about the globalization, the theory part of the globalization, and then I will try to connect these scapes uh, within the context of education, globalization in education, and um, so. Um, Caroline, uh, talk about the thoughtscapes, ethnoscapes, leaderscapes, tenoscapes, financescapes, and ideoscapes. So um, how could these relate to the globalization in education? Uh, obviously, eth ethnoscapes. Uh, we have many international students here. We um, leave our home country, come to America, is, um, um, or we come here and then we can go to an other country for, as an exchange student. So you can see the flow of uh, people around the world without any borders. And the second part is uh, media scapes. Media scapes, for example, uh, from my home place, I could see the advertisements of the overseas university uh, in Hong Kong because of the media. When you switch on a TV, um, you can see many channels from different countries. Um, and then the tunnel scapes is uh, like the explosion of technology nowadays. Because um, I can, for example, I want to search 
um, International Education Master's Program. I could just go on Google and then tons of universities will come up. And other than that, um, it um, uh, escalates the um, online program all over the world. You, like Hector or Leah, they're, they're in Sri Lanka and LA and then they could talk with us together, present the things together. And the fourth one is finance gate. And um, for example, finance is like being to work out your shouldn't see. So for example, my family can pay for my things back in Hong Kong through the technology. Um, there is no border at all. And the idiopscapes, I think, is um, very related to what we have studied in the class. Like what um, David Baker, the book, uh, he talks a lot about the dignity, the human rights, uh, what it is related to the modern uh, education revolution. So all the new uh, ideas come up, like um, social justice, human rights, freedom, democracy, and all all these relate, relate to the um, education revolution in the past 150 years. So in the following part, I will um, I will try my best to relate the um, what the what the author has talked about to the real world or my from my own experience. So the second part was about to characterize my station. And um, um, so it is the central force in the modern world. And the second point was um, that the laboring population brings the laboring population into the lower class sectors. And I think uh, from my understanding, it's about the division of labor between the developed countries and the developing countries. Because uh, for example, like in America, when we call the um, Center Center, it will direct to Mexico or India. And then from their past, um, um, they need to empower the laborers there um, to at least to talk, uh, to learn English so that they could um, talk with us um, so that it, lower class sector can uh, learn a lot more. And um, the third part, uh, the third point is about the inten intensified senses of criticism and attachment to politics in the home state. And I think it's mostly related to the post um, colonial, colonial era. Like, um, I think Ukraine will be a very good example. That's the clash between two political views in, in a home country. And for example, in Hong Kong, we ruled by Britain for so long. And uh, there's a big clash between uh, Chinese uh, and the British ruling. Uh, like from the point of view from the citizens, some are pro-Chinese, some are pro-British ruling. So uh, because the citizens know a lot more about uh, them before through the media, they know how to confront with the government, how they can change the government. So uh, it's, it increases the, um, the, the clashes between two groups. And the fourth point is about the new market for film companies, art impresarios, and travel agencies. It's all about globalization because uh, you can see the international film <coughs> Um, festivals all over the world. Um, um, they can have it here one year, the second one in the another country. So um, you can see that um, the flow of people or the arts um, all over the world without any borders. So um, the the fifth point is like um, the conclusion of this part is the loosening of holes between people, wealth, and territory fundamentally alters the basis of cultural reproduction. And then um, the, the following part is about the changing role of gender. Because of the globalization, I think uh, the women have been empowered a lot. And um, and also because of the mass media. Um, for example, the, the dual role of the women, they have to struggle the time and the uh, resources between the home and the workplace. And this is what um, this part mostly talking about. And then the following part um, is about the transnational policy. Um, um, the, the first one is about stopping the debates about the world, the world and the relationship between them. And, um, and the second part, I like the word hijack of the culture by liter literacy, literary study. I think hi hijack is like attack. Because uh, of the constant changing of the context, so maybe one word that we need to between the old days and the new days. 
um, the context of the world is changing because of the changing culture, uh, incre like increasing the pop culture. Uh, the teenagers will view it differently. So um, you can see the internal debates about tech and anti-tech. Um, and the, because of the uh, explosion of the technology, technological growth, um, people write less. But then the, the words will change its meaning as, as well. So um, relationship between the word and the world. In the book, um, the author said that the word is the contextualization part of, the, of this era, how people um, express it. And then the world is the uh, globalized interaction between different aspects of life. And then um, the following point is about the um, social media. Um, because mass media is a role um, in the cultural flow, um, there, are, there are new kinds of politics, collective expression, and new needs for social discipline. Um, and also, it allows to imagine life, imagine world. That's the main part of this um, transnational cultural flow. And then the third main part is about um, consumption, consumerism. And I think the author is, uh, the, this part is mainly about the phenomenon of the uh, capitalism, different, different phenomenon of the capitalism. So the first part is consumerism. <laughs> The per um, the personal uh, fight from the personal north, but then it's a collective uh, uh, people. When they get together, it will become a mass consumer uh, revolution. So it's like a build building up a uh, material world. And then, um, Hey guys, can you please mute yourself if you are uh, online? I just say, mm -hmm. yeah, I just have to say, 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 okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I'll just type it. Right. And um, it's, it's, why it becomes uh, collective is also because of the repetitive habits. Some very large scale consumer, consumerism revolution. And then the second part is uh, from the uh, perspective of the and, um, and the author brought up the concept of uh, Christmas because it's a time constraint. Uh, for example, Christmas is a very different time, and um, we're constrained by the time because we cannot shop for Christmas gifts. Like in the middle of the day, like from September of all the summer. And then people will watch, people will watch uh, the trend of that year so that you know how, what to buy for your friends and family. So we are uh, uh, confined by the time. And also, uh, the pace and in intensity of the change, because every is different. So you have to follow the trend. And then, uh, the third point, um, they also talk about. Um, it, revol it revolves around intersection, some tree law and fashion. It's the um, it talks about the old days, like in India, the old societies, what they how they get. So um, from this point of view, he defines theology, theology, genealogy, genealogy. Genealogy is like more outward. People will see the pattern of consumerism, the interaction between people. But then genealogy will uh, bring people more inward because it will bring uh, the history of the family, so that uh, they will they will look more in opposite to what history is for them. So at the end, he says the more diverse a society is, the more the history of its interactions with other societies, the more fragmented the history of its consumption practices is likely to be because it's all over the place. It's not very focused on one one point, so it's very fragmented and there are, there is more diversity. So the third part of um, about how fashion and nostalgia related. But for me, he not only 
fashion. He talks about uh, architecture and also design, how nostalgia will um, stimulate people to, uh, to consume more. So um, at this part, um, he, he used the uh, example of patina. This is a, a material like a copper, but when time um, passes by, it will, I think it will become more uh, ancient. It will look more ancient and make the uh, building more pretty. Yeah. So it will evoke nostalgia. And then because of yeah, because over time, um, it will change. And then um, he also talks about the yeah. different patterns in India, Japan, and France. How uh, the consumerism, uh, the pattern of consumerism from the historical perspective is so different. In India, um, the department, the departmental store, um, always after the advertisement have been served for like 40 years. So, uh, so in India, it was like advertisement first, and then the blossoming of the. And in um, Japan, um, is the, the consumers were stimulated by the television viewing, and then they were stimulated to buy more. And in France, both of them goes hand in hand. The departmental store and the advertisement are like at the same track, at the same pace as uh, developed. So um, different countries have different patterns of development in consumerism. And then um, the fourth point uh, um, is not only how fashion is whole clothing, furniture, and design. And, um, and nostalgia is very important because um, it sees your, your, your personal history. For example, the lifestyle, um, the life stage, the landscape, and the scenes. I could uh, give an example in Hong Kong um, how how the companies use nostalgia to to stimulate people's consumerism. For example, the property market is so um, is so um, vivid, how to say is um, is very active in Hong Kong. They want people to buy the property by um, having the westernized view. For example, they they will have a very uh, glamorous. Uh, Lobby and then uh, uh, design with in interior design within the apartments. Then the figures will be dressed in um, like queens and princes, queens, <coughs> uh, queens and prince, because they want you to be like queens and prince. Not only that, because it's because of the British ruling, uh, it will give you a lot royal feeling. So they they will uh, give people the nos nostalgia for British ruling so that you want to buy this luxury apartment. So this is a, a linkage between what author said and the um, real life. And then uh, he also brought up the person called Frederick uh, Jameson, nostalgia for the present. So this one is mainly targeting, uh, targeting the youth market because in the future they will become nostalgic for this time. For this time. So it's the mass media targeting the youth market. So, and the uh, um, final point of this section was about um, commodification of time. Means time is the value of money. Um, it's like the product. Um, and then, um, it, because of the commodification of time, um, it creates the index of everything. It creates a, a ranking, um, like the ranking for um, for different companies, um, for this to distinguish different kinds of work class and occupation. So you can see, um, we we'll, we'll have the link, we have the thinking about oh this person of this ranking will earn more than others. So you know how how the occupation is linked with um, with the time, or people will, with the with a higher ranking um, will earn more, but then they have they can work fewer hours. So I think it's the idea of commodification of time. And then um, it also talks about um, free time um, is, be is the time between work. Because work is um, you earn the money, but then free time is the interval between working. So it also uh, relates to what uh, Benjamin Franklin has said. 
um, time is money. And, um, and this is the last part of the session. Um, because of all these res uh, consumerism resolution, there was a new form of labor and that surfacing. Um, um, from my understanding, this part, new form of labor means a lot of new jobs that didn't exist before, like uh, surface sector is blossoming. Um, and then, like the developed countries, they will move the move the um, manufacturing part to the poorer countries. So it's a shifting shifting dynamics of the world. And then the pressure from consumerism is the tension between nostalgia and fancy. And so nostalgia and fancy are the two main parts to for consumerism. And consumerism is the link between the nostalgia for capitalism and capitalist nostalgia. So this is um, my the end of my part, and then we will have a little break, and then after that we will have a little activity and continue the discussion part. Oh, sorry. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Um, so we'll move on to um, um, to chapter to talk about the yeah. talk about the cricket. Yeah, can you hear me, guys? Yes. Okay, excellent. Uh, basically, okay. Uh, I mean, uh, one one chapter is dedicated only to cricket, and it's uh, what what he calls the Indianization of the of the sport and. Uh, Basically, I'm going to read the, this quote and then explain it. The Indians accepted, adopted, and internalized the cricket game into the culture in such a way that it became a new icon for the Indian community, transforming the lifestyle for certain parts of the population. When, when, when the, the English decided to give independence to India, uh, obviously they had already, I mean, introduced uh, the cricket into their, their uh, life, into the way the sports in, 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 in India and 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 ba basically what, it, what he wants to say is that it was so the, the Indians adopted that the game so so as, as it were part of their life that that they had everything arranged in, in, in a way that they did want, they didn't want to lose the game they didn't want to just uh, be independent and, and, and forget about the game no they wanted to be part of their normal life, and in in some cases uh, they started to create. I mean that the the ambience and the engagement towards the community to keep on practicing the the game and be part of the daily life in India. And and at some point, some Indians were were basically the, those days there was certain legal laws regarding social structure and all this. But they found out that with the game some people could have some mobility within the social structure. In other words, move like up from the financial point of view, they could make more money if they were into the game, with a part of this game. So, so they, they, they started to, to create uh, different uh, places where they could uh, play the game. And uh, still, well, they, they had some uh, prints that that wanted they were so in love with the game they they started to to pay high high wages to the to the players and and involve the rest of the community so they they started to to create this ambience so that the cricket was like a, a daily weekly the monthly activity for the population and behind that behind that they started to grew new, new ideas of how to develop the game within the community and create the opportunity for to people to move move in, in their own social structure, move up, in other words, improve their style of life. And uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, they cricket transformed not only people as individuals, but also changed the management of companies involved in communication, media, finances, public relations, marketing, and social welfare. Behind the game, there was all this industry because the, the you know the, the as as Padurai mentions, media and communication was an important issue going on, and and the they saw that they could make obviously money because you know all this all uh, behind all this type of activities there's always the 
the, the money behind this, they could make money and they started to establish how can we show the rest of the world and the population in India the, the, the game itself. So TV, radio, magazines, all of this type of media yeah, and forms of communication start to dis be displayed and talk about the game. So everyone was involved. So there are big companies funding the game. They brought players from other places. They try to uh, establish uh, training centers for, uh, for for the for the new players. So uh, the the players, the big top players, had their own managers. I mean, a lot of money was going on, and this created uh, the situation. What uh, I was saying it was that. Indianization of the game. They they adopted it as a as a new thing for them. That's part of their life. And it, I mean, we're talking about 30, 40 years ago. Nowadays, it's it's it's, it's still on. Um, not only India, Sri Lanka, uh, Hong Kong, many other places. And it, it's 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 incredible that the game is is so into society that. It, when they do the trans, they, they transmit the game in a TV or in radio. They do it in five different, I mean, basically five different languages. So the other population will be uh, uh, following the game, no matter if they speak Hindi or Sinhala, English, other lang or the two languages, dialects. So <clears throat> they were able to create this as as part of the the daily life of the of the people, and. Uh, Finance uh, from the man finance point of view, marketing point of view. I mean, there's a lot of money going on, <clears throat> and this this created a different type of life for, for for all the all the society. Even we find, at least in my experience here in Sri Lanka, there's some places, uh, restaurants, but basically all the ambience is around cricket. You have TVs around showing the different games, uh, teachers from the different uh, countries. We have now. Countries like Australia, South Africa, uh, West Indies, all of this, and every every like six months, there are, like big tournaments going on. So it was something like wonderful for for the Indian society. And if we if we move on to the last uh, slide, like the major issue, also he he mentions that it's incredible how the game at some point transformed not only uh, the way of life people, but also the 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 way how people relate to each other. Uh, from the religious point of view, we find that sometimes if, if, we, if we have a different way of thinking, of, uh, we have different religion, sometimes we don't like or we don't want to, to, to mix with other, other people if we don't have the same religion. In the case of, of uh, cricket, no matter what type of religion you are, you as a group, you're all together. Yeah, they have five or six different religions as a group. You're all together, and this is one of the issues. Is like it's it's a mass 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 event. I mean, massively, they they move people towards the game and uh, creates like a different ambience. You're different, different with different people, different religions. You don't think about that at that moment. You're thinking about we're fans, we're followers of cricket, we love cricket at that at that point. So it it basically transform also uh, how, how people uh, as a group move in, in, in society and, and the way they think. So those are basically the, the things that uh, the main issues that he, he mentions in, in the chapter dedicated to, to, to cricket. Okay. Are you finished? Yeah, there's the last one. Cricket was an time activity that led to the Indian community to think as a unit and that's, that's what we were talking about. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you. Can we have some minutes break and then ask for your face or you are very tired? Just so I don't want to for the um well she caught me. So thank you. Okay. Can I can I ask you send me the slides and I'll put some on for tonight to the rest Yeah. After and it would be nice to be able to refer back to this. Okay. Oh. Where are you going? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Are you talking about my part? I don't know. But I'm okay. I just so oh, you gave them a break before your yeah, yeah, because yeah. because they're very tired. Oh. Oh. Yeah, yeah, because I thought that would be yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's a just yeah, yeah. It's a good idea. It's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. So we we open. Yeah, we're not. Yeah, I will finish it if you want. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, Hopefully I'm not too loud. Who's the ghostwriter right now that's touching all the PowerPoints? Oh, it's me. <laughs> um, who is explaining the upcoming activity? Did you want me to do that, or are you set on how it's going to work with the five groups? Um, we, can, we, are, we are set for that, so we can uh, talk a bit from this end. Yeah. Unless we really want to. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you would. you like? Yeah. Would you like to guide this part, or if it, we don't mind? <laughs> um, however we like. I mean, it's it's always a challenge from our end, the <laughs> online people, to really feel like we're interjecting or jumping in at good moments. So, uh -huh. just 
Oh, yeah, I invite you to involve us when you can, just so that it looks like we're not <laughs> sitting back and watching while the whole thing goes on. No, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. We're okay. I, I thought maybe you had like an extreme interest in introducing <laughs> the activity. Yeah, then, then when we, I mean, we've been enjoying the time, but yeah, I think yeah, he's the expert in those, in doing those things. Okay. okay. Yeah, I can do a little introduction to it, and then you guys can figure out the logistics in the classroom. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Thank you, Leah. Yes. It's a little like. She will introduce, and then we will do the following parts. How to write a good. Explain it. Yeah. 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 I think I think sometimes it helps people to get up in Now I'm like three or five times like people if you are you get hot. And I think the translator is he has still, has done a good job. Like good job, yeah, good job. But 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 uh, but uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, unnecessary even yeah. for the interview. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
the lower class about oh. wealth. Like I think that that's his example yeah. of like of the state. Yeah. I think it's like the post state. Oh. Alright, so we're back. They got their coffee. Yes. Yeah, we're sure how to have coffee. We should have like uh We're <laughs> 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 like cookies or donuts. Yeah. How long can you go now? Yeah. I'm going to get a bit of 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 a bit yeah, yeah, I actually like, I forgot what you were like, ooh, very, like, they use, the reason it's kind of like, I'm going to use a lot of these surveys, so I'd be a reason. Me too. Are you going to leave with them or do you go to the other side? I'm going to go to the other side. I'm going to go to the other side. Okay. I'm going to go to the other side. 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 Oh, I don't know if there is a yeah, because gym. Oh, I don't know if there's a gym there. I, I just know well, it's not like a private gym. It's like anyone, anyone can go. It's eighty dollars a month or something. Oh, it's crazy. Yeah, there's like a gym there. Yeah, and it's like it's like a gym. Yeah, 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 it's like a gym. Ye
And yeah. I will post them on course sites so that you have access to them because I think there's a lot of good information that you provided on there. So thank okay. you. Back to you. Okay. Thank you. And um, let's go on. I will quickly finish the about the course and then we'll have a I'm just going to interrupt you. For those of you who are online, can you please mute yourself when you're not talking? It's just because we're getting some feedback in the room here, and I think it might be showing up on the recording, which will make it difficult to hear when we watch it back. And whenever you want to contribute, just unmute yourself. Uh, we're happy. I mean, you, we want you to contribute. It's just the feedback. All right. Sorry for interrupting, Sean. Back to you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'll quickly finish the four slides and then we will have some activities and discussions. And uh, the first thing I want to talk about, and maybe I already talked about it, and it's about the author's unique Indian background. It's called, or like, this kind of unique uh, in Indian background is called related to his opinions in this book. Because every time he talks about his families, his, um, his, um, his um, father's, uh, uh, stories in India and also his uh, his son or his wife something like that and uh, from my opinion on the one side because at first he thought he said that he was attracted by the American and the modernity and the culture some, something like that and then he come to the United States to study so the author mentions a lot about about uh, um, at least I feel that he is admires the cultures and uh, some all the things about the United States and then he regards the uh, the United States as a stable, plural, and pro prosperous country. And even his wife, his, he said that his wife was the right from, like, uh, is an American. And he has a son with multi multicultural background. And uh, this makes him feel that uh, his pa passport about the Indians is, uh, like, the, it, his identity is, uh, like, less related to Indian. But on the other side, his, uh, on, the other, on the other hand, I think he, the author is also feels uh, like he's never belongs to U.S. And even though he lives in U.S. about uh, 30 years, and uh, he feels like he's a foreigner. I think, like as a foreigner here, I can totally understand what kind of feelings that he has. And uh, the second part I want to say is that, uh, is that uh, actually this part is uh, like maybe I am not so understand about his uh, his grammars or uh, his long sentences about the about the whole book. And so that's why I always feel confused that uh, he has a lot of contradiction ideas, maybe because he has a, a contradictional characteristics for himself. I don't know. And uh, for example, at the beginning, he talked about uh, the prime modernism, if it, uh, but uh, from pro Professor Kohn's idea that uh, the prime modernism in this book, the author thought that uh, it will, it, it is disappearing. And uh, for example, he said that uh, the the Philippines people that they are, um, they are has uh, through the American cultures or American TVs or, or mediums or movies. This kind of uh, American cultures that just influence about the Philippines youth. Uh, but on the other hand, he also talks a lot about the, the other examples. that says that, for example, the Koreans, even though they hear, they still. Uh, have the cultures or have the habits about Koreans and, and uh, similar similar example he said hey he just raised a lot of examples like this and also like he mentions that the patriotism whether the uh, patriotism has the future or not but from at first I don't know because I've never think about it I think for me patriotism is very abstract and uh, if you say if you say okay I'm very I love my country. I love China. Okay, but uh, what do you love? You love the people there. You love the cultural language, or you love the nation state. But I don't know. It's very abstract for me. So, what does it mean to of the patriotism, and and does it very have have the future? If it's the future is uh, what does it mean about the future? Is it will it is will still going on, or does the nation nation and state still exist? I don't know, I'm just confused about all these things. But the author doesn't have a very clear about the things and have very clearly about the ideas or perspectives, at least for me to understand. And then um, uh, the third thing is about the author, in the third part, the author mentions about uh, the development of international organizations like the United Nations and um, other institutions. 
and also he mentioned about NGOs. He thinks that these kind of international organizations and uh, and uh, these NGOs development development will decrease the power of the nation state. Um, for example, there in 19, in 1909 there are about uh, 200 uh, NGOs, but in 1970 there are more than 2,000 NGOs that uh, that has built all over the world. He thinks that this kind of uh, uh, NGOs will like people will if the if the country or the nation state cannot help help the people there. These NGOs can help those people's needs, can, can fulfill these people's needs, and then it will decrease the power of the nation. But I'm not totally agree with this opinion because I think that um, uh, we've already talked about about the international organizations, even though like the United, uh, United Nations or the World Banks, uh, these are the international organizations. And I think um, like uh, these are uh, from my Point of view, I think this uh, kind of uh, international organizations are like under control of the Western countries, and uh, it is legitimate. And uh, and uh, like if a country is very powerful, for example, in the of the uh, the United States, they are very powerful. They can like more they have more rights in these kind of organizations, and they have um they can like the uh, the agendas of this uh, of uh, of the countries who join in this. Um, in this organization, so I think that uh, in this you know, uh, in this international organizations, uh, the power of the the power of the nation state, like for example the United States power, is still exists and it will not decrease. It otherwise it will increase. And the second is that uh, I want to make an example of the net, about the China. And uh, the NGOs in China is not so uh, very popular because uh, China wants to like. For example, China's uh, ideology is different, and uh, and uh, the Chinese government want to control. Maybe it's not control, but yeah, actually it's it's control. It's con want to control the nation, like make makes uh, at least to make the country more stable. If the NGOs from Western countries, they will spread their uh, their perspectives or Western cultures into China, even though these NGOs can help. Help maybe help people in China to like build the, the schools and the support the education or the support the development of com communities. But um, but as long as uh, these NGOs will like will influence the, the power of the chi of Chinese government, Chinese government wants to like against this kind of uh, uh, organizations. So the uh, the uh, the fourth part I want you. Say that after reading this book, I feel that we are all at large. It's not only about uh, the uh, pre-modernism, locality, or uh, patriotism, or the author themselves. I feel that uh, we all in we all part of this world. And then, if you move one place to another, you will face kind of uh, always feel you are at large. Like for example, I come from China, and uh, when I come here, I feel even though I feel that I have to uh, like join in or or because I'm in America and I have to uh, uh, I have to join the cultures, but actually in my real life, most of my friends are come from China, and uh, if his uh, he or she is come from my city or my hometown, I feel more safe, and uh, I think I. I'm not uh, like I'm, I'm. I don't want to against the American culture, but uh, but uh, un unconsciously was uh, structured in this kind of cultures, which makes me like more make me feel more safe. And second is about language. You mean though I was uh, I was talking English when we meet, meet, meet people, but when we when I say a Chinese, I will always I've never talked about English. And the uh, story is about religion. I'm not a Christian, and uh, but. If I want to join in, if I want to join in a kind of a locality, I I will go to the church and meet more people. This make me more feel that I am part of that kind of a local locality. And the first part I want to talk about is a, a taste of the food. I think 
I've never like this is very important for me. Even though, uh, like, I want to enjoy different kind of um, food, but I always enjoy Chinese food, and uh, I would rather do it to myself instead of going outside to to eat someone's things. And I I also like spicy food. I don't. Maybe I want to try some other things, but uh, unconsciously, I will always do this kind of things. I think. I think everyone in this um, world, uh, you are like structured or unconsciously have a lot of characteristics, have a lot of uh, localities about yourself. You cannot change it, even though you are trying to. I'm not sure it's good or bad. Okay, so that's my opinion about this book, mm -hmm. and I have, I have some ideas, and then we'll have a um, <coughs> class activity. Yeah, yeah maybe. Yes, Okay, um, we are going to get you up and moving around and thinking about how this plays out on paper. Uh, my initiation into globalization was actually through a geographer, and he put great emphasis, as you can imagine, on maps. And to grapple with this idea of scapes, a variety of scapes, we're going to break you into groups, and you will have a map, a blank map, in which you will determine in 2014 what are the different scapes that we have now. So if you have media, where is the media hub? Where is the um, different ideologies? Where are the major hubs that we have currently in the world? So I can't physically move you into groups, <laughs> but someone there will help you um, make that happen. How old are two of these uh, groups in one group? Uh, so then the whole group together? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, pair. Pair up. Uh, so one for two, right? Or one for two, or ten minutes? Yeah, yeah, five, ten minutes. I guess five to ten minutes. As much time as they need. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can do either. I'm so nervous. It's a circle of draws. So what do you have two or three people then? Oh, yeah. we have uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, kind of, we may left. That's right. So there are no yeah, pairs anywhere, but we may left. Do we have to have a triple? <laughs> I was wondering. I was like, wait. I thought we had enough. Well, I know how to explain why you only like to eat spicy things. Because that part of your mind has not been used to your life yet. Even though your body has left China, your mind, your mind is still there. You haven't been deterritorialized yet. Why don't we switch it so that the people online can see the groups during this part down? You just go back to the, the page of the Hangout. And then if you move the mouse over the left side of the screen, you'll see, yes, thank you, it's the green arrow. Oh, the camera. There you go. Oh, I thought it did that always. I thought we need to move this. Oh, which one can you see? Oh, you've been showing them the PowerPoint slides. Or the screen, what was ever, whatever was on the screen. Oh, what they were saying. Okay. That's why when you had this before, it was like a tunnel. Okay, I thought there was like a, a, a screen share, a PowerPoint app. That would be awesome if we could do it that I way. Thought, I thought that's what was happening. Oh, no. Okay, I'm clearly not watching the recorded classes. <laughs> Uh, which also would change if oh, we want to like uh, switch the camera. I think this one. Oh, uh, no, uh, this one. Watch this one. Yeah, we'll do this one. Oh, oh well, there's so much conversation. Oh, okay. Oh, no, I'm in this <laughs> I mean, so obviously Gail can, yeah, Gail can. Uh, so, uh, Carolyn? Yeah. I have a question. Are we supposed to use the reading in a specific way to inform our. Are we supposed to use it as just no, for that was, just for us? That was just yeah. in case you didn't have the. Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's pretty complicated. Oh, okay. So, this doesn't have a table. Yes. <laughs> so, okay, so, so obviously, can Gail hear me? Gail, can you hear me? Hi, Gail. Oh, yes. 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 Oh, yes.
yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, to escape, you want to escape or, or just instructions? Okay. Yeah, this that's is what you want. Yeah. Oh, I can explain to you. <laughs> so, if I put this in front of the I was just trying to see because Gail can't do the activity, so yeah. Gail, basically, we just gave them um, a map of the world, just with like no country names, just a map, and we asked them to be, like draw. Um, or label where they see the scapes in the world. So where maybe they, they see an ethnoscape or a mediascape, technoscape, um, and they're just like drawing links to that. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If you, I don't know if you had, if you want to, if you had an idea, we can, we can start with you or if you wanted to share. If not, that's, that's fine too. But it's basically just this map. And then you just put some skates on it. Let me see. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I gotcha. Okay. And then, yeah, where do you think the technoscape originated from on the map and where does it end up or is it just a cycle? Um, honestly, it was really difficult for me to hear a lot. Uh, I don't I don't know if my computer is just really low, but it was it was like this earlier for the first class I sat in um, on here. It was just everything is really quiet. I don't know if anyone else has that problem, but it's just really hard to hear. And then plus, I missed a while of the beginning of the presentation, um, probably about the first like 15 or 20 minutes. Okay. All right. No worries. Because people migrate from there and spread around it. Because actually, humanity, all of human beings, originate from Africa. As I know, like at the beginning, uh, in the market, you change your graphic, they have a DNA test, you can submit your engineers and survivors, and then they all come back that you are nowhere. Uh, 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 yeah, you, you know that you're infected, but then the science tells you that humans actually are from there. So yeah. it's from humanity. Yeah. Or, or, yeah, it's the biggest thing. <laughs> Would be the, you know, the, the triangle trade of slavery. So the slaves were brought out of Western Africa and they came to the Indies or what's now the Caribbean and then up to the Americas. I think that would be a big ethnoscape, like one big cycle there. So that's why um, people uh, start to move to the islands from different continents. Yes, they thought it was great at the very beginning, but they found that it was rough. Hey, I'm, I'm not rushing at all. I just want you to keep an eye on the clients. Okay. Uh, okay. Just a few more minutes then, guys. How is everybody doing? Good? Okay. That's one to share then. <laughs> and then if we could just have each pair or triple to share one of their scapes. Yep. Yeah, that would be good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you need a couple minutes. Yeah, a couple more minutes. Yeah, not not right now. Just a few more minutes. Yeah. 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 And in India. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 My mother is um, from Sweden, and then my dad's family is, you know, classic Irish English, but my mom is Italian, yeah. Mm -hmm.
Oh, can we, can we just, uh, this I think we maybe don't have to. Yeah, it's just like to this. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know what? And I think it's important to test some of the Maybe like to choose. Like we said. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Okay. Yeah. One more minute, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I think yeah. maybe just a little bit more. Choose one more to debate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we can ask you to do that. Yeah, we can ask you to do that. I don't know if they heard yeah. Yeah. Alex is um, yeah. the yeah. 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 Um, it looks like it's interesting. Um, the the of, yeah, the, the cricket part. And then the, yeah, the... Yeah. All right, are we, does everyone have escape? An example of a escape or two? Yeah? Okay. We'll bring it back then in like 10 seconds. I think we are laughing. I don't know why. <laughs> Oh. Sure. Right. <laughs> All right, guys. So, um, we want to do this and then move on to some discussion questions because um, we are coming, you know, into six o'clock. So. All right. Okay. Okay. Oh, you guys. Oh, yeah. Volunteer. So the one we find most um is actually. When we were talking about media feeds and media feeds that we in our picture uh, link them together and that okay, yeah. um, if you're going to put a center for certain types of media it probably depends on the yeah. ideology that you subscribe to so we kind of had a certain ideology media link in the u.s and kind of mm -hmm. spreading or linking to kind of western europe mm -hmm. um in kind of our geographical north south area mm -hmm. um kind of over to africa as well and then Kind of Eastern European and having a different link of media and ideology mm -hmm. and that spreading more in their geographical region. So mm -hmm. we found that those two were um, had to be both linked and then kind of separated accordingly. Mm -hmm. so that's what we talked about. We kind of like that. Right. Yeah. Right. And yeah, Africa, he does actually kind of talk about mm -hmm. those two sections together or those two states together in, in one section. So yeah. You can separate them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what are the results of other groups? Mm -hmm. Who else volunteers? Yeah. Yeah. Our team is when we try to map uh, the the according to the five independent map that group organization makes, we find that that the Western countries and the especially the mm. USA is, mm. the, is the central point of the five yeah. uh, mm -hmm. the five uh, mm -hmm. the, the steps in the so it's a, it is a map that is very different uh, uh, from uh, from uh, from the author's conclusion. The author took um, most uh, yeah, one of the features in the locality, but uh, but uh, yeah, we do find the map we uh, we think the world in terms of the five steps and so on that. The, the globalization is uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And considering the reality, the reality is the author is Could someone rephrase what is being said out there? We can't hear any of that. So even if the scapes, many of the scapes might be originating in the West or most specifically in the States, 
And even if they don't, then many of them might pass through. Right? Other groups? Or the last group? <laughs> um, I think probably a lot of what, what we pointed out matches what the other groups just pointed out. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we did talk about was the increase of um, Islam as a political force, mm -hmm. and so more movement of money and ideology through like, North Africa and the Middle East, mm -hmm. um, kind of as a growing force for some of these things, but mm -hmm. maybe haven't had that. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Very good point. And actually, from this activity, we would like to see the results if globalization at and this moment means westernization. Because it shouldn't be, but the trend is like that. It seems like westernization, the western influence uh, over other countries. So um, we would just like, yeah, if it um, aligns with what we discovered before. Yeah. yeah. That we discussed before because globalization shouldn't be equal to westernization but at this moment of of error mm -hmm. it is it seems to trend yeah, so, yeah, the, 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 the also try to, to, to capture the word uh, the, the five words captured in the first chapter in the first part but i find in the last uh, uh, in the two part two and part two we had to uh, give up this uh, uh, this attempt and the uh, uh, and the only, uh, only uh, uh, emphasis on the, the migration and the media. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we cannot find the 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 the, 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 the technical gaps and the finance gaps and other other gaps. We are uh, uh, through the, the, the whole book. So, so, so uh, perhaps uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's hard. Well, the microphone's here, and you're all the way back there. So, yeah. Uh, so I have something that are you going to were you going to talk explicitly about the reading that the suggested reading? Because I thought there was a section in there that kind of addresses that westernization as globalization. Can I talk about that? Where you going to? I don't want to. Well, yeah, something you were planning. Yeah, we can talk about. It. Yeah, I can. Oh, yeah, we were going to move into another thing, so go yeah. for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, on page 183 and following, really, he talks about how uh, all locality building has a moment of colonization, and so I, I I find these discussions about globalization and westernization to be about that moment of colonization, um, and and I what what I don't know what bothers me. Maybe that's not the right word, but where I find myself. Um, being a little bit annoyed with the continuing association of globalization with westernization is that it, it is it is a it is a reimagining of that colonization moment over and over and over again. Which I'm not saying that doesn't exist, but I think that what he also brings up, and, and he says it in a kind of a, a, a different way on um, the next page on 184, the central dilemma is that neighborhoods both are contexts and at the same time require and produce contexts. So the idea is that, yeah, that there's this moment of colonization and that westernization, um, it certainly is how we define globalization now. Although as we talked at the beginning of the class, globalization is not new. Right? It, it, is, it is expanding at a remarkable rate, the, the discussions about it and the, the obvious impact of it now in a way that it never has before because of factors we talked about. But I, I, I'm not really sure that we can always say that globalization has been westernization. Maybe in the moment we're in now, that that is the most obvious creator of it. But what's interesting is as as we sort of move forward through time and experience and history, even though we might be creating these moments of colonization, I think that the ways that globalization is occurring and all the ways we we talked about both with Hatterai and other things in our class have uh, there there are. How do I say this? 
So those moments of colonization have created their own versions of globalization that, that, that continue to occur. So I'm not really sure that it is always westernization in the same way that it was at that moment that defines our current era. I'm not saying it very well, but, but is, the, is the sentiment coming across that there, there is, there is a, uh, well, I, so the word I'm trying to get to is isomorphism. There's a, there's a way that things are changing that may have definitely begun in our era with westernization, but it has become normalized over decades to, or, or in this case, centuries, to the, the point where it isn't the same kind of westernization that it might have been 20, 50, 100 years ago. And I think that's important to, to recognize and to try to define, you know, rather than just sort of broadly painted as westernization, let's talk about what are the different characterizations and the different moments of globalization. And, and of course, we always want to bring it back, back to education. So if we, if we, if we refer back to um, some of our earlier readings on the expansion of, of formal mass education, right, we can, we can talk about some of those initial attempts to spread that 100 years ago. Um, and we talked about some of the Western origins of that as having a decidedly Western orientation to them and being moments of Western colonization of ideology, of structure, of expectation. But as those structures are reproduced, they, they become more and more distant, distant from that first moment of, as he puts it, violence. Not that there isn't a violent moment in it, but it's not the same. It, it's different somehow, and it's recreated by communities that are not Western, right? So there, there's, I mean, there's so many of you from, from China here. Mm -hmm. I mean, China has a great history of education. In fact, a much longer history than the West, right? And so, but we don't talk about that. What's interesting, though, and we've talked about this a little bit with Peace Corps and Three Cultures Revisited, that this, this sort of Westernized version of formal mass education has now embedded itself back in China, which really was the place where a lot of this the structure started with the idea of examinations and uh, you know education for elites, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a that's, that's a funny way that it has traveled back around. And now we have this idea that there's a Western education model in the country, at least this is how Westerners I think critique it, in the country that actually may have originated the model in the first place. So I, I find an irony in that in that conversation mm -hmm. that I would love to hear your your comments on. Or, or whatever. Sure. Let, me, let me open it. It's real short. I just wanted to put this out there. I'm kind of glad you said that because I'm kind of feeling it, and I don't know if I'm going to say it as well as I'm thinking it, maybe. But um, so, so one of the readings that we read um, for, for here, I don't even know if it's in maybe um, in the globalization reader, it said something about um, Korea, you know, maybe fighting, I don't know if fighting is the right word, uh, to become um, Japanization, you know, fighting Japanization. Right. Yeah. So right. So like they're fighting, like to want to be too much like Japan. They want to keep their own mm -hmm. entity, their own selves, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking about that. And when I was looking at this map, we didn't. It probably, we probably the first glance would probably start it in the West and work its way over. And we didn't do that when we were talking and stuff. And I almost feel like you can almost fold this map in half and kind of say like, okay, this side of the world kind of does it this way, and this side of the world kind of does it this way, but not so much from the United States everywhere, but maybe the United States or maybe somewhere in the West or whatever, out, but probably maybe just the larger nations are the ones that are kind of leading the way, but not not just on the West, you know, anywhere. You know, they're the ones that are leading, maybe because they are the larger ones, maybe because they have the money, maybe because whatever. So um, I think I'm in agreement with, with you and, and you know, it was interesting because when we were, when we were looking at this and, and, and that comment keeps coming back in my, my head when I read it, like, well, I don't know like, much about Korea. I can talk about the West and stuff where I'm from, right? But I, I don't know. And when I was reading it, I'm like, oh, yeah. So smaller nations maybe getting beaten up or overrun or whatever the word is from larger nations or powerful nations doesn't necessarily mean it's the West or, you know, you know yeah, so different. I think quickly just going off that, I think that kind of goes back to some of the earlier conversations we had in class about looking at globalization at different levels and that at uh, you know the level even how you said you can divide this map in different ways and talk about flows in different ways because mm -hmm. if you want to you know depending on how you want to trace different ideas and how you know how is this country directly being influenced or how is this region being influenced or you know I think that if, 
that we can talk about it and even on different levels that maybe would have you put in the centers of some of these ideas in different places. Right. Not just from the West to everywhere else. Yeah. And I think that's how the, the skates that he talks about are helpful because you can scale those skates up to the, like the multinational flows of capital that he talks about or you can scale it down to maybe you know, town A, town B, town C, and that's still a skate, it's still a flow, there's still something moving. So that's, it is helpful to use his skates in that way, to think about those. I think also, um, from what I've gathered of this, these kind of ideas, I think he's also really big on different versions of reality based on your perspective. Mm -hmm. So, your imagination, like, yeah. you know, like you just said, you are from the West, your view of it, and the way these flows work are a certain way, but your view mm -hmm. of how these forces are affecting your life if you're in China or if you're in Africa, it may be very different and you can't fully understand that reality until you're in it. So mm -hmm. I have a question uh, I want to put uh, on that uh, yeah, this text is a new uh, look when you see them uh, a mobility, not the bad reality. So uh, that we mean but not means the 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 the, the who was a knowledge uh uh sort of uh westernized uh, not not this one. So when the uh, the 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 thing that was I think that was uh, in, in terms of the balloon, the idea of technology and uh, uh, and the media that balloon and mobility, yeah, they can, uh, they can, uh, yeah, they, they have it, uh, uh, the, 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 yeah, the main uh, name from the uh, country. Uh, but this does not mean to, uh, uh, this is the balloon. They can see the balloon, not the reality, not the reality. So I think, that, uh, for example, in China, the, the main the, the idea uh, the Chinese main idea is uh, very uh, Chinese uh, Chinese uh, not so Westernized uh, and of course in the Muslim uh, the Muslim countries also yeah but I, I yeah uh, according to uh, uh, according to the uh, the author they want to they want to discover the uh, the mobility of the five, uh, uh, not the static uh, uh, and the reality of the world. Uh, the want of the something is moving. Mm. Yeah. What is moving in this world? What is moving? Yeah, because the the money, the the ideas and the media, the Google, for example, Madonna and the 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 American, the the many many. Dominant in many, many spheres and fields. So, so we can say that mobility is the main from not the reality. And the mobility is that this mobility we are eventually or precisely influences the locality of the location. I don't think so. It is a very yeah, they also, according to the author, it is a thing very cautious and very, uh, very diagnostic about uh, the, uh, the diagnostic uh, between the globalization and the lo uh, location. And that is, uh, with the, I think with the, with the interaction that between the, the different uh, civilization and the country uh, and the different uh, access of the international agenda, and uh, I think that the best uh, country, the idea of how to be a change themselves. Yes. For example, yeah, I, I, I have found uh, in, in the in the uh, situation uh, together about the globalization. Some of the American citizens think, think that uh, we should not uh, show too much uh, arrogance, uh, and uh, they think we are Americans is, uh, is uh, all the right, uh, and the other people who like us is all the right. So we, we must learn to uh, something. Uh, uh, we can also learn from the other. Uh, cultures and mm -hmm. other countries, and they, they must be a, a little humble. And uh, mm -hmm. so, so I think that yeah, during the interactions and the, the location is changing, and the and the 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 such uh, a, a, a very powerful potential uh, and the potentiality and the innovation for 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 for
um, contributed some uh, suggestions online. Um, Gail said that at the very beginning to our textbook, um, Amart, the, the author, um, I don't know how to Amart, pronounce it, yeah. Amart is then pro provides an interesting point about westernization. He talks about how the globalization of math, science, sciences, and technologies that came from China and India. Then years later, when these ideas, there is a resistance from the origins. An example he gave is European mathematics that were actually imported from India. I found that to be a very interesting point of view. And um, also, Hector responded to what, what, what Professor Pang said that. He said, no, no globalization, no movement. <laughs> yeah. And um, Lie also said that um, the reading selection from this book also suggested there is a competing ideas of context between local neighborhoods and with the with the nation state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very complicated conversation, uh, conversation between the different actors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Didn't he almost call it a cannibalizing or a, that mm -hmm. the the nation state and the community try to ca cannibalize each other? Mm -hmm. And I think for American education, just because uh, the like some ideas in American education that easily should be accepted by other countries, like um, in the preschool, they are child oranges or something like that. Mm -hmm. And for I, I think in the last chapter of that book, he said that uh, um, why like Japanese they have a powerful country in the world, but why they are our uh, culture are not uh, accepted by other countries is because they are so contextualized. Mm -hmm. So that's why they cannot be accepted. But for American culture, because I don't know why, like all the people think their education is good. I think because they have some ideas easy to be accepted by all other countries. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. not because of westernization, I think. It's because we education, uh, educators just to find a good way to create more better education. Yeah, they are not just copy because they are mm -hmm. um, to do some local to to internalize and to contextualize and to combine to make global uh, local. Mm -hmm. I want to respond to your point. I think why people like American education because it produces a lot of powerful people, like to influence the world, like Bill Gates and uh, uh, Steve Jobs, mm -hmm. or because of the um, political power too, financial and political power, that it influences all over the world, so that people will think, oh, the things in America will be great. I think it's not about the people. I think it's about the, the resources that mm -hmm. are available. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You yes. know, you you can provide the same amount of resources to developing country that knows maybe in the future leaders mm -hmm. they will achieve uh, the same uh, success because mm -hmm. the potential of people exists always. It's just how you develop. It. So mm -hmm. here you do develop. It. That's so, true. And also, um, I want to comment on, on your um, statement uh, about education. I think here it's education serves as a global unifier and that's why who would not want to to unite their people uh, in, in the very positive sense of the word uh, with the means of education. Just where it leads us there and how it is applied in a certain context, that's where the problem comes from comes from. And but the the ideology, the idiotic it is very positive and that is what what we want to borrow, but just the way we apply it, that is different. Mm -hmm. And I also, just while I'm speaking, <laughs> um, I think we today we used uh, colonization in the same context as globalization. Uh, the reason I would not use the word even close, even in the context close to globalization at all, is because for me. And maybe it is my subjective perception. Uh, colonization implies victimization and kind of taking away the agency uh, of the people or of the community. Mm -hmm. And whenever any victimization is implied, then that is already, you know, 
something very negative. Mm -hmm. And maybe it is negative for some people, but um, you see, I, uh, in here, in the globalization reader, we had an example about um, FGM and how uh, it was, the, the, the way it was treated by NGOs and the way it was addressed it was really not welcomed by the African citizens who were practicing it mm -hmm. because of the, the rhetoric that was used about victimizing mm -hmm. poor African women who had to do it. Uh, that That is the association I have when we use victimization in the state or sorry, colonization with the same, in the same context of globalization. Mm -hmm. Just the, the rhetoric itself. Mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I jumped from one point no, no, to another no, very quickly. Did Leo want to? I don't know. I know she had a thought. I don't uh, know. I can't. I can't. Oh, sure. Okay. So, um, Gail said one more point. Uh, responding to what she said before, she she said when these ideas were reintroduced into those original societies, they were resisted. That's what she is hiding. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we time is running out. Um, we have uh, several questions because of the time constraint. We would like to ask you which question you would like to discuss. Mm -hmm. Just want to take a minute to read them and think about what ideas you might have. Do we need to choose one question? Any the first, yeah, we'll choose one question first, and then if we have time, we can move on to another. Yeah. Yeah. I thought you guys would. I went actually with the map. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I thought you guys would jump on that one. First. I don't know. Like to break us up into yeah. What do you think? Maybe split into two to two crews, two groups, <laughs> and then we'll spend five or so minutes just gathering ideas, and then we can come back together and mm -hmm. share what you guys talked about. So four of you. So four and four, if mm -hmm. Professor Peng is, and yeah. Do we want to jump in or no? I, I don't know. <laughs> they seem pretty yep. like they're already going. Yeah. So, no. yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> So here's the budget. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So it's struggle, struggle. So I, we do have two discussions about PTAB, so they may address one or the other or both. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I did buy some points. Yeah. I know. I can still do when I go to the gym. I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to power through. It'll make me feel better. Yeah, it'll make, exactly. it'll make me feel refreshed and like some more energy. And it makes me, even though it gives me more energy, it's weird. It like helps me sleep better. Yeah. 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 And then it's like easier to go to the gym. Yes. And then you're able to do more and more and more. We leave, yeah, because yeah. 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 there's um, and Dolphin uh, what is, will be released when you do the average. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say it. It's a secret. It's a secret.
So they're gonna they're gonna talk about this for about five ten minutes, and then you're gonna have them come report out. And then is that gonna be the reflection? So it's almost six forty five. Okay, so just a few more minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Just as long as we have some sort of here's what we got out of today, so that also so that they recognize. I think sometimes, especially with such a, a long conversation about a particular book, but since there's so much to cover, I mean, you guys had a Herculean task in order to do that. So I think it would be helpful to, to say, here are, the, here are the takeaways. If you don't remember anything else, remember, you know, one, two, three, four. Okay, cool. Leah and Hector to also share. If we each share a point, that's, that's, how do I get how do I get out of this? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't just tell them. Leah and Hector, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Sorry, guys, I took your questions away. So um, we're going to have them come back to discuss for like five, ten minutes, and then we'll go into the reflection. Um, and if we each just want to share like one takeaway we got out of the book. Um, so do you guys want to um, – we'll start off here on the, the Lehigh side, and then, and, then, and then we'll end it. Or why don't – yeah, why don't we actually start off with you guys giving your takeaway, and then we'll end it here on the Lehigh side. Okay. What question did they choose to discuss? They chose to discuss, um, yeah, what is patriotism, um, will it affect the power of the nation state, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Alright guys, we're going to come back together and like 15 seconds. Okay, so they'll lead off with their point. Hi, Alyssa. Alright, guys. Just going to wait for Angela. Do you want to go back to the, um, the question? Yep. Alright. So, what does patriotism mean to you? What is the nation? What is the relationship between that and the nation state? So, what did you guys discuss? Is there a, a group that wants to volunteer? Yeah, perfect. Mm. Uh, well, yeah, I can do mine because it's uh, it's so funny that probably nobody else can do it. <laughs> I don't know if I even can. Yeah. So, um, I feel like patriotism is like a, a relationship, like the a, a normal couple relationship. So uh, if if somebody gives you something, then you mm -hmm. feel like you can, you have to give it back, and mm -hmm. only if two people give each other something, that the relationship can exist. Mm -hmm. So if we're talking about patriotism here, so if I want to really love my country and do everything for the country, and I don't get anything in return, there can be no patriotism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, and the nation state is equally it has to equally participate in this loving relationship, just as every single individual citizen has to be. Mm -hmm. That's a yeah interesting analogy. I've never thought of it like that. That's mm -hmm. really cool, though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Other group mates? Um, I like I think patriotism is uh, like sacrifice. It's very abstract for me. Mm -hmm. Like when I'm in China, I cannot feel very deeply about patriotism. But when I come here, 
if I I heard somebody else say something bad <laughs> 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 then I feel angry. Yeah. And uh, I think yeah. I can see some bad things for my country and something happened in my country, but I don't want somebody else to say yeah. <laughs> yeah, something yeah. about my country. But mm -hmm. Yeah. It's That's very you have that idea. Much, idea pretty, of, pretty yeah. yeah, the fantastical <laughs> homeland. Yeah, yeah, where everything is amazing yeah. behind you. I have to say, I related to the journey of ours on that on that aspect. It was like they took a ship to the locality, and uh, it's pretty funny because I would say here in the United States, I would say, well, I'm Italian, so I. Uh, but mm. going to Italy, I'm American. They look at me and they go, she's an American girl, and I cannot tell you the name of the president in Italy. I don't know. I don't know their national anthem. I, I'm not re I don't You're a really citizen. connect to yeah. all of those things Italians, but that is my culture and I mm -hmm. we, you know, and right. I tie very closely mm -hmm. to it and mm -hmm. you know, I was that's who I am, it's part of me. But then it's interesting to see what my children mm. how they would feel because they're once removed from that, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the yeah. further you get away from it, maybe it's not quite as strong. I mean they may grow up being a little bit proud or something like that and someone say something anti Italian, they may just be like, Hey, wait a minute, that's Yeah, yeah, I think there's a nice connection too with the Paterai. He talks about um, like virtual culture, so it's not actual tangible culture where you're surrounded by it, but you still feel this connection. And I get that sense from what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. I would I would totally agree with what Maria is saying. I mean, um, you know, my family is Syrian, um, but all of my Syrian family lives up here. But that's always been something that I have loved the most, and that's that's my culture, and that's my family, and that's my background. And I grew up in West Virginia. It's not like I was surrounded with it every day, you know. So, and and my my mother, you know, who's Syrian, she had passed away when I was young. So, really, I only got this in the summer when I would come up here to see my family. But that's something that I relate so closely to and hold so near and dear that it's like you know. It's kind of where did that where does that come from? Because, I, you know, I really probably shouldn't because I know I I wasn't immersed in it all the time, you know. But you know, so I I I, I like what Maria pointed out. I think that's a really good point. Is that it? It doesn't have to be something that you have hard evidence of and something that you know it it can be sort of an intangible, intrinsic type of thing as you know as well. Um, even if you're not sort of immersed, immersed in, in the culture or anything like that, you can still have that patriotism. I really like, I really like that. Yeah, definitely, definitely is, is the case. Uh, it's incredible how how you feel that patriotism when you're not in your country. In my case, I've been out for the last uh, six years, and and even when I was in Africa and now in in, in Sri Lanka. You feel that uh, I mean, you get embedded into the culture. You 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 know about the culture. You talk with people. You eat what they like to eat. I mean, many many things. But I mean, you 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 feel that 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 you belong to a different type of culture. But it's it's it's. I mean, you, you cannot put it aside and forget about it. Your own cultural treasure, your own beliefs, they're there. I mean, they're part of you. And and they're still there. I mean, no matter where you are, no matter where part of the world you are, no matter with whom you are, no matter what you do, where you eat. I mean, it's it's it's. I mean, you you cannot lose them because it's it's where you were raised. In my case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Vika, and then we'll. That might be the last comment, maybe. My point actually is related to what Hector has just mentioned. Um, when when there was this whole revolutionary situation in Ukraine, this one lady who lives in Portugal was writing poems, these heartbreaking poems uh, about Ukraine, uh, and then everybody started criticizing her because it basically said, "My heart is breaking for my country. I can't sleep. I cry all night long." And then they were saying, "You love your country too much. What have you been doing in Portugal for the last 25 years?" You see, yeah. and and uh, there are so many opinions that can be uh, imposed on this pure la poor lady, um, but that's a very very tricky concept. Like uh, Kelly was saying, it's a very nice comment. She said, 
um, you have to love your country as it is without mm -hmm. trying to change it. So you have to kind of be there with the with, with your state. Again, coming back to the relationship right, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. um, idea, you have to be with that person and accept him or her as 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 they are. Mm -hmm. So that's what it is. You know, you have to be there. If you're not there. You know, then, then a lot of people start questioning whether you're patriotic or not. But do you have to be Physically, in the country yeah. or, or mm -hmm. not? Mm -hmm. And I don't think there is a, a definite answer. Mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of people do suffer from the question itself. Mm -hmm. Because all the mm -hmm. brain drain and um, deterioration <laughs> uh, that is happening. It is right. happening mm -hmm. for the benefit of the country as well. Mm -hmm. Because then they might come back and enrich the, the human capital and mm -hmm. all that, mm -hmm. but they might not. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. do they still stay, you know, dedicated citizens or not? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think Milan really is very important. Like if some American born Chinese, they born in American, even though they have the same gene or other, although their parents have the Chinese tradition, culture, or ideological, but they do not have that much. They they cultured in American style school and uh, uh, surrounded by all the American spirits. They don't know anything about Chinese and they don't think they are Chinese. Mm -hmm. But when you if you are cultured in China, you and you immigrate in America, you have a very deep uh, understanding of, of your own country and you mm -hmm. like your own country. I think that's some connection you can. Talk, you can communicate with your own like community, mm -hmm. in the community. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The tension, or sometimes tension, between ethnicity and culture and nationality, I think, speaks to kind of what you're saying. And for me, a lot of what comes into patriotism is your identification with the <coughs> nation state is primary. So, you know, you may be. You may be ethnic, you know, ethnic, ethnically mm -hmm. Chinese, mm -hmm. but your primary association is American born, mm -hmm. and, and that goes, you know, both ways. But um, and, and what I was saying that that Vicky talked about was this idea of a positive association. It's it's hard to find somebody who is considered a patriot who has negative feelings about their country. So. Even though people will say, I'm trying to make changes to my country because I'm a patriot and I love it and I want it better, they're usually accused of being not patriotic because they're trying to change what mm -hmm. everybody else already identifies as mm -hmm. what the nation is. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you want to change it, go somewhere else where it's already the way you like it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You yeah. must not be a patriot if mm -hmm. you don't like it the way it is. Yeah, mm -hmm. but it's still interesting that people do try to stay mm -hmm. in, in situations where maybe they're not happy and try to change it. Why don't they just up and leave? Like what keeps you know what keeps them there? Visa no. regulation. Visa regulation. <laughs> <laughs> we have the answer. Uh, and then the the author has given us a a a a liberal approach with the idea of the country. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I said about that I'm close to the American mm -hmm. as a uh, as a Wonderful model for the future uh, patriotic government, and, uh, you know, because the American, uh, one hand, uh, 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 American is uh, so uh, country in fiber. Uh, but I, I, uh, so, uh, I think that the old has not uh, had the, 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 the main uh, the, the of the American culture. Uh, Mm -hmm. Because they 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 use the use the and they study the and the, 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 the bias politics that is also a dominant I think a dominant culture in America I think very very and uh, uh, that is very very something yeah, who, who who is very conservative on uh, neo conservative yeah 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 to 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 uh, to the patriotic. Uh, uh, for example, yeah, in Pennsylvania, there is a famous professor in 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 Virginia. Yeah, he uh, has created uh, he has uh, yeah, led a, a educational movement so called the Colonial Movement. Yeah, yeah, in America, and he uh, advocates.
perspective of the American, just shoes are not co-cultural of America uh, as despite of the much cultural. This is the, 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 the co-cultural of American students in the South. And also, and also with the, uh, with the minority culture. So, so, yeah, uh, so, a very fitting way to explain it. So, so the, the, the mere, and then you have a consensus to think that there's a cultural war between the liberal approach of the patriotic and the conservative approach of the patriotic. I think that the common core is also connected with this. But I think the American, the American, the American, they do exist. They do exist. Uh, something very special and very core culture. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, so, so, so helpful to the other, to the other, not so culturally diverse, right. uh, interesting. Right, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, I think, yeah. Yeah, I think I heard a, f a phrase one time, I don't know if this is just only Americans, probably not, but Americans complain the most about America, but we also will be the first person to defend our country. Mm -hmm. So we might whine a lot about it, but we also, you know, if someone else whines to us, we just, right, yeah, yeah. All right, so we have like three or four minutes left. Um, so we're going to turn to um, Hector and Leah, and they're going to give, um, you know, a takeaway point that they personally are going to take away from, from the book for you all. Um, any preference on who goes first, guys? I can't see you because we have the PowerPoint up, so. Yeah. yeah. Anybody, Leah, Hector? Uh, Leah, go ahead. Oh. Oh. For me, this book focused a lot on identity. So thinking about globalization and contextualization in relation to the importance of identity and how, um, how important that is, regardless of any kind of isomorphism that's taking place, that there's always the sense of wanting to have your locality, your neighborhood, that feeling of comfort, even in a world that seems more and more familiar, you can recognize, you know, the aspects of the culture, but to always have that piece that's yours, that, that feels more close to home, is what I took away from it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Well, Hector? Uh, following a little bit of the... Leah's idea, basically what I learned from the book is that no matter what or where you are, basically you are moved by this revolution ideas or mass movements, uh, it can be sports, it can be religion, uh, work, uh, technology, consumerism, media, mm -hmm. no matter what, you're, you tend to move towards globalization. But it, but and inside yourself, you have an inner core, which protects you. It's like like your your own culture that leads you towards that globalization. But still, you have the, the the core part of yourself. So you won't fall into the deep of that globalization. You're on the side, but mm -hmm. you're like parallel to that, and the, the the inner core is so so strong that I mean. Will, will lead you and you will be able to survive one way or the other. Mm -hmm. So no matter what's going on, you'll end up always with your, your, your strength, with that shield that you have of the inner core, your own beliefs. Mm -hmm. Okay. So after, yeah, I just want to follow a little bit about her first uh, interview. Because uh, before this book, I may misunderstand about locality because first I think that uh, Locality may be just a kind of a small community and uh, who share the same kind of cultures or languages or, or something like that. But uh, after reading this book, I, I realized that uh, locality, like Professor Hong said, that uh, locality, locality means transnational. And with transnational, we may find that uh, we are in different kinds of locality. Like if you are, if uh, you have the same region, even though you are from the same kind of uh, different kind of countries, if you have uh, some regions, you may be in this kind of locality. If you are like, um, uh, if you can share the same kind of, uh, or similar cultures, 
uh, maybe uh, from China, some other parts of the world, and then you feel that you, you are from this kind of a locality. Like you can, you can when you are moving, you can find that uh, you are in different kind of localities. Not just uh, the uh, territory cannot limit to you in one area. Mm -hmm. That's this kind of point of view just uh, challenged my mind mm -hmm. before this. Book. Yeah. My own reflection is that um, I do like the author's. Uh, ideas um, um, with this, they, he puts it in a very abstract way and a lot of new vocabulary that I haven't learned before. Mm -hmm. And um, now I realize the, the very big role of mass media that I didn't think of it before. I knew it was big, but he he zoomed in like through that lens to talk about this in this book. And then um, the major concepts of five tapes, and I thought it, they were all very good because it could fit into different areas of globalization. Which part, like sports, mm -hmm. economic, it could fit every area of mm -hmm. the globalization. Mm -hmm. And that's what I got out of it from this book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the part that I really connected to, um, which I which I tried to talk about in my section, I don't think I did a really great job of it now, thinking back on it. But the idea of deterritorialization de mm -hmm. and connecting back to that like the magical, fantastical homeland. And you all also connected with that point of view or that that point um, in that we may physically leave our community or our locality, but we still take locality with us, whether that's a, you know sharing of a, the same idea um, or something like that. But, but also we still do reflect on, you know, back in my country or back in my community, but in my culture I do this or we do this. And I think it's really interesting that we can physically leave a place, but we still are so connected to it. And it's, you know, a, a physical, it still feels like a physical connection. Um, yeah. Well, the question is. Last, last point, I think yeah, you might have to leave. Just a, just a uh, rhetorical yeah. question. Yeah. Can assimilation, to what degree can assimilation help you or make you get rid of that locality quickly when you leave? Mm -hmm. And can it, does it have that capacity? Mm -hmm. And that will be a question that the yeah, imagined community. Yeah, imagined community. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are you guys the imagined communities? You guys? Who will preach? Yeah. Are you imagined communities? No, I'm uh, swear. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, uh, and you I, probably still deal with that question. <laughs> 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 you probably will bring it up again. Thank you. Okay. okay. I, think, I think we should yeah. give a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Both online and in person. Yes. Congrats. Thank you, Hector, Leah, yeah. Gail. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. No problem. <laughs> Namaste. Yeah. Yeah. Well done. And thank thanks, you. guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good rest. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. A piece of advertisement. April 4th, Lehigh Speaks. I'm speaking about pedagogy and symbolic violence. <laughs> please come. Please come. Is it in, what is it for? Is it like global union thing? Or? Uh, it is no, not really. Uh, I saw from the Facebook. It's like Lehigh TEDx. Yeah. Oh, TEDx. Oh, okay. All right. I like the page. Your son, your son, your son, your son, your son, yeah. All right, Leah and Hector, we're gonna we're gonna sign off. Thank you very much. Here, wait, can you see us? Hi. Thank you, no problem. Thank you, yeah. Hi. Hey. Hi. Thank you so much. Yes. It was a really uh really very large piece of literature to try to present. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but oh, so, so. it was great. It was great. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, and I will see you next class yes. then. Okay. Bye. Bye. See you guys. Take care.